This Week in Microbiology, episode number eight, recorded May 22nd, 2011. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. We're broadcasting live from the annual meeting of the American Society for Microbiology in New Orleans, Louisiana. And what we've done today is to grab some of the speakers from this meeting, and we're going to have a conversation up here uh, with them, and including some of the regulars on TWIV. Uh, joining me today on my left, a regular on TWIM, Michael Schmidt from the Medical University of South Carolina. Hello, Vincent. It's Did good I get to it right? see you face to face. I got yes. the location, not North Carolina. You put so. me in the right state, Very which good. is always important. Good to have you. Michael's been on almost every episode of TWIM, and we're glad to have him here. Also joining us today, over on the end, from San Diego State University, Stan Malloy. Hi. Welcome nice to, to TWIM, the second episode for you. Stan was at our inaugural, inaugural episode at the very beginning, so thanks for coming back. Great to be back. So we've done, of course, seven episodes so far. This is our eighth, and we've had a variety of, of topics. And today we're going to have a broad range of topics which we've selected from the speakers at the meeting. So let me introduce those to you. On my left, uh, the leader of the symbiosis group at the Max Planck Institute for Marine, Bi Marine Biology in Bremen, Nicole Dubillier. Welcome. Thank you, Vincent. Nice to meet you, you in too. person. And nice to be um, on TWIM for the first time. Thank you. Thanks for coming. We'll be speaking to you about your, your wonderful work. Uh, also joining me today on my right from a professor of evolutionary genetics uh, at the Massey University, Auckland, which is in New Zealand, Paul Rainey. Thank you, Vince. Nice to be here. Thank you. Did I say Auckland right? You did. You did. <laughs> I'm very sensitive about pronouncing <coughs> names because mine is always mispronounced. And finally, um, all the way over to the right, Professor uh, at the Department of Medical Microbiology and Immunology, University of California, Davis, Andreas Baumler. Well, thanks, Vince. Thanks for having me. Thanks, so, thanks to all of you for coming. I know you have tight schedules. We also happen to have a huge audience in front of us. <laughs> thanks, all of you, for coming. And, of course, this is being live streamed, so uh, there are a lot of people out there watching as well. And we should remind everyone, you can send in a question, either via the live stream or via Twitter and we'll answer them as well. A big part of TWIM and all the other podcasts that we do is interaction with uh, our listeners via email questions that are sent in. Those are always fun to answer. Oh, yes. Right? They challenge us, I would say. Yes. So maybe we'll have some challenges today. All right, so let's start all the way over here with Nicole. Yesterday you gave a wonderful talk entitled Symbioses Between Chemosynthetic Bacteria and Marine Invertebrates. I think that was the title. Or maybe something like it, right? Right. I think I had something like harnessing dark energy. Oh, dark there. energy was in there. That's right. Sound a little bit more exciting. So let's start talking about this subject. And maybe you could start out by telling us what it, what it is to be a chemosynthetic bacterium. Um, chemosynthetic bacteria use the chemical energy or use chemical energy as their energy sources and then um, from that energy, they use that to fix CO2 and make biomass out of it. So we compare chemosynthesis to photosynthesis, because most mm -hmm. people are very familiar with photosynthesis. There you're using the light, the energy from light um, to be able to fix CO2. And in chemosynthesis, you're using chemical energy to fix CO2. So that, that's a good way for people okay. that don't understand chemosynthesis to understand. And it. so these... Uh, chemosyntheses take place typically where there is no light available? Well, the interesting thing, in my opinion, was that they were first discovered where there was no light in the deep sea mm -hmm. at hydrothermal vents. Um, and there, the excitement was that an entire community could be fueled by chemosynthesis. But now that after we discovered them in the deep sea, we went out into environments where there is light, like coral reef sediments and, and shallow uh, habitats, and we're finding uh, these chemosynthetic symbioses there, too. Mm -hmm. So the original chemosynthetic symbioses were found way 
deep in the ocean at these they hot vents, right? They were found at the Galapagos vents. Mm -hmm. um, geologists were actually on a cruise um, looking for, they, they, they knew theoretically about hydrothermal vents but hadn't dived to the bottom mm -hmm. of the sea and it's actually a very nice anecdote uh, that when they um, went down in the Alvin, the, uh, which is the manned submersible that they go down 3,000 meters or, or whatever depth and these vents were at 3,000 meters, uh, the geologists were completely astounded that there were animals down there. Mm -hmm. And one of the geologists is supposed to have set up to his students said, uh, isn't the deep sea supposed to be a desert? <laughs> um, because there are animals down here. That was the surprise. They were, they were completely overwhelmed by the uh, huge communities mm -hmm. they found out. So at what point did we find that there were bacteria along with these animals? Well, that's, that's a really, really nice story because um, the first animals that they brought up, they didn't have enough fixatives with them um, and mm -hmm. because these were geologists. And so <laughs> biologists, of course, have formalin with them and, and alcohol, but geologists don't. And so this was back in the days when the U.S. ships weren't dry yet. And the story goes that they were putting these animals in whatever alcohol they had to drink and fixing them in mud. <laughs> oh, my. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and because the animals were so poorly fixed, it was very, very hard to look at their morphology and understand that what they were looking at were actually bacteria. Um, so it took quite a while. It took a while to understand that the big tube worm that I showed pictures of yesterday has no mouth and no gut. Um, but Colleen Cavanaugh at Harvard University as a young PhD student um, was one of the first to really show very elegantly and nicely in uh, with electron microscopy that they're full of symbiotic bacteria. And the bacteria are located where in, the, in this, this long worm? So they um, are located in what is called a trophosome, mm -hmm. um, which is in the center of the worm. And it's a huge organ that is packed with bacteria, literally in the middle of it. What I find fascinating is that um, because their gut is reduced, it was often assumed that the trophosome develops from the gut. They know that the, the juvenile forms, the larvae, uh, don't have symbionts, and they have a mouth and a gut, and so it was kind of assumed that they swallow the bacteria from the environment and then close off their mouth um, and their, their rear end, and that the gut then houses the um, bacteria. But it turns out that the trophosome develops from a completely new tissue. So it's a whole adaptation to the symbiosis. And the symbiotic bacteria invade the tube worm from the side and develop this whole new organ that then takes over as a kind of gut, except it's filled with the bacteria. And these bacteria provide nutrients for the worm. Exactly. They fix the CO2 through, through chemosynthesis, through mm -hmm. the chemical energy produce carbon compounds, and then pass them on, leak them probably um, to the host. And in turn, what do the bacteria get? What they get is all chemosynthetic bacteria need a reduced energy source, which is the sulfide. And then to use that energy source, they need an electron acceptor. Um, and in this case, that's oxygen. And for free-living chemosynthetic bacteria, there's a constant dilemma because mm. reduced compounds and oxidized compounds rarely, or there's only a very, very thin area where they co-occur. And what the host does, it provides them both with the reduced and the oxidized compounds. And the tube worm has done something really special. Its hemoglobin, the blood that normally carries the oxygen, has been modified so that it will also carry sulfide and mm -hmm. um, bring that to the simion. So as new worms develop, I don't know the, how worms, are they? They grow. From what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the juveniles are larvae, is larvae, what they're called. And they're born without bacteria. Exactly, exactly. And then they acquire them from? It, from the environment. And, and they actually, it's like, a, it's like a pathogenic infection. They're coming mm -hmm. through the skin. And there must be incredible recognition mechanisms uh, for them to let only their symbionts through and not any other bacteria. So there's host specificity in these relationships? Com uh, to a certain degree, there's host specificity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at the 16S level, which is one of the genes that we use to, to identify bacteria, um, they share the symbiont with other species of tube worms. But otherwise, there's clear host specificity. So yeah, on the bottoms of the ocean where these worms are living, in proximity, there are other marine invertebrates. 
that have their own symbionts as well. Exactly, and those are completely different. So different. at that level, at the uh, different communities, the mussels that have their symbionts are different, the clams, they have their different symbionts. So, so each um, uh, species, animal species, has evolved independently in convergent evolution and has taken up symbionts. So these types of symbioses have evolved multiple times. We mm -hmm. know that at least nine animal lineages have been able to take them up. So there must be a clear, strong, selective advantage to these associations. Vincent, <clears throat> when I was listening to this talk yesterday, I was a little hungry. <laughs> so it reminded me of Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> you know, as the donut is made, it has not yet that wonderful shell. If you've ever had a Krispy Kreme donut, you know they're covered with this fine layer of glazed icing mm -hmm. sugar. And that's the way I was thinking about your two worms, is that the war worm is born much like a Krispy Kreme donut without this wonderful coating. And then when you add this coating is when you really have the end product that delightful Krispy Kreme donut, but in your case, you have this wonderful symbiotic relationship, and the icing sugar with the donut really makes Krispy Kreme Krispy Kreme, and similarly, the bacteria give that flavor to this tube worm, and as you said, there are multiple types of, multiple occurrences that this has occurred, so you have, if you will, a chocolate donut, a vanilla, <laughs> vanilla donut, <laughs> and you, you have the right bacteria interacting at that interface. So I guess the question is, how do they know to do this? Uh, uh, okay, so if I, I, I'm not sure if... You weren't hungry when you were thinking of this. <laughs> uh, I was actually, well, uh, <laughs> I'll spare the details. Um, I think one of the key questions that we're trying to get a handle on is how, what, are, who's the driver in these symbiotic associations? So, are the bacteria the ones that are dying to get in? Are they the pushers? Are they the ones that are determining it? Or is it the host that is saying, oh, I really want you to come in and be my symbiont? Um, and, and what this is, this is actually a brand new model that I've come up with, and I was discussing with Margaret McFall and I because we're getting ready to write a, a review about how uh, symbioses evolve for science. And, and, and we're trying to think of uh, who's, who's sitting in the driver's seat and who, how are they responding. And what I think is that it's all about the bacteria wanting to get the compounds that eukaryotes leak because eukaryotes are leaky. They, they have lots of carbon compounds and they're always exuding them. Mm. And the amazing thing is we're finding that these chemosynthetic bacteria that we assumed were only chemosynthetic and obligately chemosynthetic are turning out to be heterotrophs. So it tur they're turning out to be mixotrophs. And what one can imagine is there, for example, down in the deep sea, there's no nutrition. It's really hard for them to get organic compounds. And there's an animal and it's leaking carbon compounds. So, so they, they must really have a desire to be, to associate with them. Um, then I think though, the host has to make a decision about- Leaking. Well, and also, that's where I think the symbiosis develops. You have to, if I'm gonna let you in, I, I, okay, so the symbiont's knocking, or the, or the free living bacteria is knocking on the door and saying, I wanna get in. If I'm gonna let you in, what are you gonna give me? Um, so that I think that this is where uh, you then see the symbiosis begin to evolve with all the complicated crosstalk mechanisms that we know from these types of associations. Well, I, looking, looking, at the, looking at it from my perspective of why does a bacterium do this, bacteria have tremendous surface to mass ratios. Mm -hmm. And I think they're much better at pulling gas, gases, albeit these gases are at extremely high pressure in the deep vents but they're very efficient at capturing the gas or the hydrogen sulfide, which is the energy source, if you will. They're much more efficient at doing that than the eukaryotic cell because the surface to mass ratio is so much less. So they're getting, getting the free energy, your dark energy, if you will. They're playing capture the flag with the dark energy, and then they're giving to the worm something 
that the worm will then cough up its waste products, which it perceives as a waste product, which is actually carbon and energy for the bacterium, or carbon for the bacterium, which the bacterium is solely missing. Right. I think uh, what's really important to understand with these symbioses is that the animals, to date there is not an animal that is able to live from chemosynthesis. Mm. Their animals are heterotrophs, so they cannot, they cannot live in these environments because there's not enough nutrition um, at the, in the deep sea because it's, it's the, the nutrition in the deep sea is um, really coming from the surface for all the heterotrophs. Um, so by taking up the symbionts, they are themselves becoming chemosynthetic um, and it enables them to colonize the environments that they otherwise would not be able to live in because there's no nutrition for them. They can't, they can't, they can't be there otherwise. But, but now if you talk about this world that we didn't know about, that is, the, the organisms that aren't in the dark, Right. Mm -hmm. in, in your talk you said, mm -hmm. this was in our own backyard and we were unaware of right. it. Right. So what's, what's the selective advantage in that situation? The leakiness of, of the, the carbon compounds, that's easy to understand. But energy in those other places shouldn't be so limited. Uh, that, thank you for asking that question <laughs> because that is exactly what we're trying to get a handle on. And when we look at the seagrass sediments, um, and I would really like to do an exhaustive analysis of the community, and, and we haven't done that so far. We find, in my opinion, much higher abundances of symbiotic animals, of different animal groups, than we do uh, in, let's say, uh, in the bay next door that we work in. And as I described in the talk, when we gave the pore waters to our metabolomics guy and we said, so measure the carbon compounds in there, and he says, well, you gave me distilled water, and I say, no, we didn't. I think those are effectively deserts. Just like the deep sea is a desert, I think these porous sediments um, are deserts, and, there, and there's no nutrition in there, and therefore, uh, nutritional symbioses are able to dominate. That's, that, but that's, I haven't proven that yet. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit how you study these bacteria. Can you culture them or do you have to do other things? Well, people have been, since their discovery, have been trying to mm -hmm. culture them um, and haven't been successful. Uh, what I did mention is that my colleague, uh, Heide Schultz, from my institute, has now played around with them on the last research cruise that we were on. Mm -hmm. And she did something that most microbiologists will not do when they, you ask them to culture them is because most microbiologists take them, take the tissues, grind them, and then they do a dilution series. So they're diluting out what the host is giving them and, and is just throwing them into a state of shock. And so what I have, I've been asking numerous times and, and she was willing to do is I say, just, just incubate the gill tissues with a little sulfide and oxygen and just keep them alive for a week, you know, just, just, and that seems to have done the trick. We have an, or she has an enrichment um, and, and she's nurturing it. Um, so they are, many of them are cultivable. Those that have reduced genomes in the clams, probably not. Um, so yes, we try, but that's not, most of our work is using cultiv cultivation independent methods. So genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, the standard microbiological methods that so many of us use. The, f the funny thing is in your talk, you said, well, she may not want me telling everyone about this, and now you're telling the entire world. <laughs> Why? She, she's really gonna kill me. <laughs> well, it's in Germany, it's Sunday evening, and maybe she's, <laughs> watching the news. <laughs> so before you could culture them, or even now, what kind of an experiment do you? I remember reading one of your papers, you drop wrecks to the ocean floor and, and you see, is well, that one way that you do it? Okay, so one of the things that we're very interested in is what happens when we withdraw the energy source mm -hmm. in the symbiosis. Mm -hmm. So we take the muscles and we put them in nets and we move the muscles away from active venting, so away from okay. where the energy sources are. Um, then we have to make sure that we cover them very nicely in boxes because the crabs just go nuts and try to eat them up um, because What's they're a all- It's smorgasbord. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, and one of the fascinating things we're seeing is that within 10 days, almost all of their symbionts are gone. 
So they've mm -hmm. gotten rid of them. Um, and we're very interested in the process. Um, are they expelling them? Are they digesting them? I'd guess anything they would digest them because why give up that source before you've gotten rid of it? But then what's the crosstalk? Do they start, it's a process where we see for the first day, we see messenger RNA expression levels so that the, the, um, the uh, proteins they're using to fix carbon, the symbionts, we see that begin to go down. And is that a signal for the host to say, oops, you're not producing anymore, you're not giving me carbon anymore, and then I'm going to get rid of you? What is the process? That's what we're really interested in looking at. And then we return them after 10 days, or have returned them, and then we want to see how they take them up again and how that process occurs. So who makes the quorum factor that tells them to stay put? Is it the host worm? or is it the host microbe? And notice how I gave host to both. Because they're, they, they're, they're voting, they're, they're, they're knowing that they're at that critical juncture. Or you probably, have, have you played the games and asked if you know, the canonical homo serine lactone flavors are there? Um, you know, we looked for that, um, so I'm not, uh, we don't have, or it, on the muscles that I'm working in the deep mm -hmm. sea, um, we're just getting the sequences. Okay. And so there I don't know. So in our shallow water symbiosis, we did look for all the quorum sensing signaling compounds, and we're really disappointed that we haven't found them yet. So um, we do know that um, from others that specificity is going to be through lectin, right. uh, glucose, uh, le sorry, lectin sugar interactions. Um, but that's not signaling, that's not a conversation. So we don't understand how the conversation is going on. Do we have chemosynthetic symbionts in us? This is probably like ABC microbiology, and I should definitely know the answer because what I'm thinking about is we I, we definitely have in our gut methanogens. Yes, okay. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> I get to ask okay, so we do questions. have, um, but there we have methanogens that produce methane, which is right what we know about. Mm -hmm. um, so, and they are certainly um, chemoautotrophic on their archaea. So we don't have the same symbionts right. as these uh, deep sea or shallow water. Right. Uh, we were talking about that have. last night at yeah. dinner, that sure. third of the population makes gas, right. literally methane. Exactly, and those are, those mm -hmm. are methanogens that are... So we have, what, are... six people here? So two of us make gas. <laughs> <laughs> not, me, not me, for sure. <laughs> we can count the audience, too. <laughs> So what most of your work involves invertebrates. Yes, right? yes, I'm because vertebrates do not, we have so far not found a vertebrate with this type of typical chemosynthetic okay. symbiosis. Right, that's why I was asking you about people, but I suppose you look hard enough, you will find it. I um, would find that remarkable, yeah. because first of all, they don't live at hydrothermal vents or cold seeps, or I think, I think um, I'm trying to think if I could imagine a fish or any kind of vertebrate where I think they move too much. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to imagine <laughs> that an animal that is actively moving um, would have this type of symbiosis. Okay. So I have one more question, then we'll, we'll move on to someone else, unless Stan or Michael has something else. As a virologist, I have to ask you, do we know if phages play any roles oh, in these? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually a really nice story because our fan it's a nice question. Thank you for answering it. I had a, uh, we have a graduate program at our institute called uh, MARMIC, uh, Marine Microbiology Graduate Program. And I had, an, there was an excellent student there, Melissa Duhane, who came from the US over um, to do her PhD at our institute. And I taught a class in viruses just in the lecture series. And she got really excited about viruses, but because she wanted to work with me, she said, what I'll look for is viruses in these chemosynthetic symbioses. This is a couple of years ago. And I was like, ah, not important. Important. <laughs> so I missed the boat, both on looking for viruses and having a brilliant student um, who's now done her postdoc with Matthew Sullivan and has been working mm -hmm. on phages. So yes, we have incredibly high numbers of at least insertion elements that are remnants of, uh, of viral infections. Um, and yes, I think they're playing a very important role in shuffling the genome around. Um, so yes, I think they play a massive role. <laughs> Great. Well, it sounds like there's plenty to do. Oh still. my gosh, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Um, and so if you want to be a cruise director, this is the path to it. 
now a cruise director with non-scientists or with scientists? <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> you, can you can aspire to be a cruise director um, to do some really cool things. Right. Well, we, we do, well, I, I do direct the research cruises where I'm the chief scientist. Yes. But I think dealing with homo sapiens would be another level of com <laughs> complexity that I would need training for. <laughs> Can I just ask one more question? Of course. How many times do you think that this evolved independently? Oh, this God. is a pretty complex process. To right. So we know that it's evolved in at least nine different animal lineages, and we know also in many, many different bacterial groups. So that's what I'm saying. The selective advantages. We used to assume that symbioses, uh, symbiotic associations do not evolve that often and that it's very difficult. And now we have a completely different opinion, including our beneficial microbes in our gut, which is that symbioses are rampant everywhere. The selective advantage and pressure must be very strong. And, and, and both we and the animals uh, in, in any environment and plants are full of these symbiotic associations. Can I follow that up? I'm wondering about the repeatability of these ecosystems, they're very diverse, aren't they, in terms of the, the structure of the ecosystems around the different hydrothermal vents? They're very diverse in that some are sedimented and some aren't, but also in terms of their energy sources. Yeah. So some of them have high sulfide concentrations and lower methane, which are both energy sources. And very intriguing energy source, something that we've actually um, submitted to nature and is looking very good, is hydrogen. Um, so far uh, in chemosynthetic symbioses, the only two energy sources that have been recognized are methane and sulfide. And we've now shown that hydrogen um, is hydrogen-fueled power packs that they have in them as being used as an energy source. And this is common at vents where there are high hydrogen concentrations. But, but where you have different um, uh, invertebrate communities, are the microbial symbionts the same? I presume that to some extent they're not, but that they're using different uh, energy sources. So far it but looks like the speciation is based on the host species and not on the environment. Mm -hmm. So that it's, it's not ecologically driven, but rather a host symbion co-speciation pattern that we're seeing. All right, thank you, Nicole. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's move on to Andreas way down at the end there. And, and get you involved here. One of the questions that you're very interested in is something we think about in virology always, and that is how does a pathogen benefit from causing disease? And I know this is something that interests you and you have some very provocative findings using salmonella. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your thoughts in that area. Well, salmonella is, uh Unlike other, some other pathogens, it's a pathogen that is not an accident. It actually exists in host populations. There's some diseases we get, which is an, we, we are not a real host, and, and mm -hmm. the disease is an accident. But Salmonella actually needs to live in us and transmit to the next host, and that's where all the selection is on the organism from an evolutionary point of view. Um, and so the organism causes diarrhea, and the question we had is why would you cause diarrhea? And, it seems to be an obvious answer that diarrhea helps transmission, but there was very little done, and actually the details looked very interesting in the end. So how does diarrhea help as a selective method for salmonella? Well, so it, it helps, uh, in, in case of salmonella, it helps to, uh, to colonize the gut in the first place. So the organism has a dilemma when it comes in, you eat your infected burger, and. And the intestine is, is already heavily colonized. There's about 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 microbes in the large intestine. That's a large number. I don't even know what you call that number, but it's very large. <laughs> and uh, so the best seats in the house are taken. That is right. the problem. And Salmonella has found a way to elicit help from the host to compete with the microbes that are already there. And so it elicits a host response, and that host response helps it to outgrow. So it has something to do with, Michael, your favorite, or one of your favorite topics, the battle for iron. Right. Right? So can you tell us about that? Yeah, so there's one, uh, there's one aspect of it, is, which is uh, a host response aspect. And so the inflammatory reaction, of, of course, is designed to uh, inhibit growth of microbes. And one of the battles 
and the body is fought over iron, which is an element. And the elements are always targets for withholding mechanisms because microbes cannot make them. Microbes can make pretty much anything, but of course they cannot make an element mm -hmm. like iron. And so there is host uh, response mechanisms that prevent iron uptake. And they're turned on during, in, uh, during a host response, which we call inflammation in the gut, and there's protein secreted to prevent iron uptake. Um, and when you are entering the intestine and you trigger inflammation, you of course, you, you, you found a way of, uh, you have this tit for, for, for tat uh, mechanism that we had, the microbes usually make little molecules that help them to internalize iron and the host finds a whole protein to prevent this and then mm -hmm. someone will have found another way to outmaneuver this defense. And by doing that in the, in the inflamed gut, it, it, it is at an advantage over other microbes that normally inhabit the environment, but normally the environment is different. There's no inflammation, and then mm -hmm. when you turn the inflammation on, the other microbes are not as well adapted and some other benefit. So by inflammation, we mean the induction of cytokines, infiltration of cells of various kinds in right. the host, right? <clears throat> so how does Salmonella do that? So Salmonella has uh, uh, two complicated molecular syringes, which it uses to inject proteins into host mm -hmm. cells. These are called type C secretion systems. Um, and Salmonella uses those to invade epithelial cells and then survive in macrophages. And as microbes enter the tissue, the host knows there's something wrong. There's the innate immune response of the host, which essentially consists of barcode readers that are toll-like receptors and, and, mm -hmm. and not like receptors. These barcode readers basically scan the organism and decide this is a microbe, this is not self, and then they trigger a host right. response. And then host response is, of course, a lot of cytokines are involved, but in, in essence, there are three branches. There's activation of macrophages, which kill intracellular bacteria, then there's neutrophil recruitment against extracellular bacteria. And then there's a third arm, which activates epithelial cells to release a lot of uh, antimicrobials into the lumen of the gut. And that is kind of an attempt, I assume, to clear the surface of the epithelial mm -hmm layer to, uh, from bacteria. So some of the proteins that play in the battle for iron are induced by some of these cytokines, correct? Yes, yeah, so the key cytokine there is IL-22, mm -hmm. which is, a, I don't know, that's kind of specialized for an audience, I guess, but these, uh, so this cytokine IL-22 is, is relatively recently discovered and, and orchestrates this epithelial response um, and then you have this host defense molecule called lipocalin, mm -hmm. which binds an uh, uh, iron uptake molecule for bac of bacteria. And salmonella has that molecule, but it adds a couple of sugars to it, and now lipocalin can no longer bind, and then it, mm. it can grow under those conditions. So salmonella can get the iron it needs, it can grow, and the resident bacteria don't get the iron they need because the host molecules work against them, the antagonists, right? Right. It's all about competition in the sure. gut. It's, uh, Perhaps with the example, it's a brown chocolate donut which is heavily colonized by bacteria and you try to enter there and it's difficult. I don't know, for me the food analogies don't work. Especially right. with <laughs> diarrhea. Yeah. Especially with diarrhea. All right. But all right. I understand that one. Um, <laughs> this is right up your alley, the iron bath. Yeah. The iron is, is absolutely fascinating of, of how microbes are constantly battling for it. Last week, or in the last episode of TWIM, if anyone is interested, we discussed how these wonder bacteria, the cyanobacteria, that grow in the light during the day, effectively harvest all the iron out of those photosystems and replace it into the nitrogenases at night. They literally trash all the proteins that were used to during the day to fix carbon and do all the wonders of photosynthesis. And then in the evening when they need nitrogen because you know, carbon and nitrogen are essential. They fix atmospheric nitrogen and they literally move the iron. They don't dare let it out of their sight. It's absolutely fascinating. And the fact that Salmonella does this and competes so substantially in this concentration of bacteria that are greater than the United States national debt. <laughs> I mean, that's the way I always look at it. It's okay. bigger than the U.S. national debt. Uh, which we all know is a big number. Um, it, it's remarkable of how these microbes are able to steal the iron from the true residents of, of the gut. And how that 
First, the, the question I always ask is, how could this have possibly evolved? And you look at it from the selection argument, the selective pressure to do this. And then you look at it from the perspective of my typical audience, was, which are medical students, is they always want to know, so why is there diarrhea and why haven't we evolved away from it? And then what controls this process and how do we help our patients deal with diarrhea once they get it? You know, we were talking on previous TWIMS about a one bucket disease versus a two bucket disease. That has to do with which way it comes out. Um, and uh, so interested to hear your thoughts on, on how you think about this and, and how you uh, begin to dissect these problems, you know, looking at it, you know, again, stealing a line from last night's talk, where you look at it from the top down as opposed to from the bottom up. So I'm not sure about the two buckets, but in terms of evolution, these things probably evolved in the environment. Iron is very limited in the environment because oxygen is very prevalent, and when iron is oxidized to iron-3, it forms insoluble aquahydroxid complexes that precipitate out, and uh, the solubility is very, very low, 10 to the minus 24 or something uh, in molarity. And so bacteria in the environment, cyanobacteria, they have to have very sophisticated mechanisms to acquire iron against a very strong concentration gradient. And so these mechanisms probably, these uh, little molecules to acquire iron, these are called siderophores, which are high mm -hmm. affinity iron, iron chelators. Those develop, develop most likely in the environment. <clears throat> in the host, the situation is very different. There's lots of iron in the host, right? Most of it in hemoglobin, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so the host, Is that accessible when it's in the hemoglobin? It's not directly accessible to bacteria because uh, the host, of course, has found many ways to withhold the iron. And so when, when it is reshuffled and that happens, when the erythrocyte dies, the mac a macrophage fishes it out of the circulation and uh, takes the iron and, and gives it to a molecule called transferrin, which then in the blood transports the iron to the bone marrow where you have hemopoiesis, uh, so you have no erythrocytes being made. And so that transport process is, is done with proteins that have a very high affinity to iron and they withhold iron from, uh, from microbes. And unless you can somehow strip iron off transferrin or lactoferrin, uh, you have a hard time getting it. May I ask a question? What Please. about beneficial microbes? So as medical, as medical microbiologists, you guys are all saying it's all about competition and disease, and of course, as symbiotic microbiologists, we're saying it's all about beneficial uh, interactions. And in fact, uh, the second talk last night, I oh, think, absolutely. showed very nicely how important it is. Um, I've never thought about this, but could it be that you might also be giving iron to those microbes that are good to you? Well, iron is part of the diet. It comes in uh, through the food, and there's beneficial microbes in the gut, and they take some of the iron, I'm sure. And, the, and as long as there is no inflammation, there is no strong effort to minimize the iron content in the gut, this is my understanding. And the, irons, uh, the bacteria compete for iron in the gut, so they have lots of these receptors that can take up siderophores, and many of them are siderophores that don't make themselves. So they can steal iron. There's this iron piracy in the gut, which is, I think, very prevalent. And so there's probably a battle for iron among the microbes uh, there's a lot of competition, mm -hmm. um, not so much from the host point of view. The host started, starts getting worried when bacteria enter the tissue. So as long mm -hmm. as they're in the, in the intestine, I think the, the host is happy. And Maybe the beauty the of the gut is that it's reduced because, you know, humans, we carry oxygen around in an iron box called hemoglobin, and we never let it out. It's, the oxygen's always locked in this little tiny box, and we only show it just for a brief moment in time, and then the box slams shut. We, we don't like oxygen around unless it's well, going to do it's something. Destructive. Yeah. It's very destructive. Mm -hmm. And so we, we want to keep that, uh, that oxygen in that beautiful iron box called hemoglobin. So why don't the salmonella outcompete all the bacteria that they are winning the iron battle with? Eventually, all of these uh, food poisoning episodes are cleared eventually, right? Is it because right. of our immune response, basically? So initially they do outgrow them, and it's not so much iron, even though iron is certainly part of the battle, mm -hmm. but it is, you still have to eat a lot of the other things that 
make you make another bacterial cell. And that battle has more to do with the, uh, the host response generating a lot of radicals in the intestinal lumen and then you get you generating uh, electron acceptors for bacteria. So we mm. all use oxygen as an electron acceptor, we talked about it, and that's how we produce energy. Under anaerobic condition you can use things other than oxygen alternatively, mm. but they're not present in the anaerobic environment of the gut normally, but when you have inflammation then these things become available through the host response and then salmonella can use this for respiration. And respira the big trick about respiration is that now you can use things that uh, fermenting microbes can can't. So when you ferment, it's a very different form of life, you always end up with a product that is still pretty, pretty good nu nutritionally, but uh, fermenting microbes cannot use it any longer. Uh, mm -hmm. so things like ethanol and lactate and so forth. Things like we, we, we like to eat because we breathe oxygen, but the fer fermenters who produce it cannot further yeah. utilize it. Now if you can do respiration, you can take these things, you can take what falls off the table of the microbiota and basically sidestep the competition for nutrition. So if you took, the, say, to make a very simple situation, if you took the gene for, it's called salmochelin, mm -hmm. it's the salmonella, iron binding protein, which isn't influenced by lipochelin, that's the host protein. That's right? right. If you put that into E. coli, does that change its pathogenesis? So interestingly enough, some E. coli have that protein, and it turns out to be the E. coli that survive on inflamed surfaces. So there is one group of E. coli which cause urinary tract infections. They're normal, you know, normal colonizers of the gut, but when they end up in the urinary tract, they cause bladder infection, and these E. coli have these genes which, which produce salmochelin. Hmm. Um, most other E. coli don't. And so it seems to be an uh, adaptation to living on inflamed mucosal surfaces where you, you have okay. lots of lipocalin produced. So you also mentioned that you are interested in co-infections of salmonella and HIV. Can you tell us a little bit? Oh, you read my website, I see. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> Vincent well, This is one of the less known problems with salmonella, but it's a very large problem. And I was made aware of, of that in a meeting when I was approached by a gastroenterologist, Melita Gordon from, from Liverpool in 2003. And she said, oh, I'm, I'm, li I'm living in Malawi for the last six years. And she was a, she's a gastroenterologist. And she said, you know, salmonella is the number one cause of hospital admission, number one cause of death in my hospital. Mm -hmm. um, all these patients are HIV positive and they have bacteremia, they just present this fever, no gastroenteritis. You know, what, what is the problem? Anybody works on this? And actually nobody at the time was really working on this issue and it's kind of an under-recognized problem in infectious disease. In Africa there's a huge number of deaths from salmonella bacteremia in immunocompromised mm -hmm. individuals and these are either HIV patients in adults or in children, it's right. children with severe malaria or malnutrition, and it's uh, a large numbers, probably you know some four to six hundred thousand deaths a year. I bet there's even alone. even measles, is that's a huge cause of death because it immunosuppresses, and I would bet salmonella is playing a role in a number of those as well. I haven't seen any measles study, but it, it yeah. certainly is a is a big killer in Africa. So what? What are you trying to tease out with this interaction? So we were interested in what is actually uh, making patients susceptible to, to salmonella bacteremia. So in, in, in individuals which are immunocompetent, which are healthy, um, salmonella causes gastroenteritis and everyth mm -hmm. everything stays localized to the gut. Um, but in, pa in HIV patients, when you're severely immunocompromised, the organisms penetrate this barrier mm -hmm. and, and uh, cause of bacteremia with 20 to 40 percent mortality, which is very high. And so we were interested what the barrier functions are, and we developed a ligated loop model in, in rhesus macaques to uh, mm -hmm. study how H SIV, in this case, uh, compromises the barrier to salmonella. And it seems to be uh, a defect. So the T-cell depletion salmonella uh, benefits from is, is what SIV is, is known to cause, so it, it, it causes mm -hmm. the T-cell depletion. But when you systemically deplete CD4 T-cells, you have a defect in TH17 cells, which in the bone marrow, they're very important for um, GCSF and GMCSF production. So these are two uh, cytokines that are important for neutrophil development. Mm -hmm. And neutrophils are really the cell type that, at least in humans, is very efficient in keeping salmonella localized 
Macrophage is also important, but if, you, if you're neutropenic because you have cancer therapy, for instance, mm -hmm. you are at an increased risk to develop salmonella bacteremia. And if you are an HIV patient, you actually have reduced neutrophil counts when you are at the eighth stage, so at le less than 200 mm -hmm. T, uh, T cells per microliter. And so you have a neutropenia, and your neutrophils also develop less efficiently, so there's uh, less of a burst and less of a microbicidal uh, activity. And that uh, prevents systemic control of salmonella. So I would presume that triple antiviral therapy would prevent this from happening because that restores T cell levels among other cells. Well, you, yes, and uh, you asked that that problem went away with the, with the heart yeah. therapy totally since you have to have very low peripheral T cell counts to get that right. problem. It used to be a problem in the 80s. Right. But Andreas, in addition to HIV, this has really given insight into a, a perplexing problem for a long time, which is the salmonella typhi problem in, in humans, and why does typhi cause the systemic disease versus the gastroenteritis? Maybe you could comment on that as well. So yeah, interestingly, typhi did not at all benefit from the HIV pandemic because typhi is already jumping this barrier on its own and the way typhi does it, it has a capsule that actually prevents neutrophils from uh, bursting essentially so it, it, it prevents the oxidative burst neutrophils by preventing complement deposition and CR3 the complement receptor in neutrophils is linked to an oxidative burst so typhi already has something to prevent neutrophils from functioning very well and and that's why it causes a systemic infection Nicole, do you want to slip out now? It's Thank you. <laughs> Can I just say one thing that yes. ties these two things together? It's interesting because when you talk about the evolution of these symbionts in this marine environment, it, there's not a lot of competition there. I mean, it, you're really coming into virgin terrain. And when you talk about the evolution of these uh, characteristics of salmonella, it's coming into a really crowded environment with a high level of competition. Uh, so it's really interesting to contrast those problems associated with evolution of these new traits. Although I would argue that I think the competition for space in, in, at hydrothermal vents where you want to attach quickly so you can have sulfide and oxygen is very high. And so there the competition, although it's not nutritionally driven, is that the cop that that you're competing with all the other bacteria out there that want to stick onto something or get into something? So, uh, I'm be interesting to compare the different drivers: space or, or attachment versus nutrition, and and the anaerobic gut environment versus the uh, the the redox environment that they're trying to deal with. And don't forget temperature. And that's the other thing, because it gets cold very fast exactly. as you move away from the vent. Exactly. Nicole, so thank you thank for you very us. much. This thank you. was uh, Fascinating. truly enjoying for thank myself, you. too. Nicole Dubillier from the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology in Bremen. Stan, why don't you scoot over, and we'll get Oprah-like now. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't move furniture. We don't have prizes under it, either. I don't know. They haven't checked. <laughs> Barbara's looking. Do you have any other questions for Andreas before we? I'd just to like go? to comment. Um, I attended your lecture this morning and I found it absolutely fascinating. And you gave me many useful pearls that I'm going to take back and give to my med students and really drive home some salient points about type 3 secretion and why they need to know about tetrathionate. <laughs> fascinating you. talk this morning. So I'd like to add one other thing, sure. and it's really very interesting because there are so many people who have been working on salmonella pathogenesis for so long, and there's still a tremendous number of unresolved issues for this one stinking little pathogen, and great things coming along now. And a lot of these things demand an understanding of, of basic fundamental physiology. They're not some complicated virulence principle. They're things that have to do with how you acquire food and food. how you it's use all about food. it. It's all yeah. and selective yeah. pressure yeah. driving the yeah. food choices. Yeah. And you know, I have to say that you know, the saying we all stand on the shoulders of giants is very true here because for us, 
having this idea with tetracyanate respiration, it was very easy. You know the genes, you knock them out. You know, you knock them out. You show the phenotype, but somebody had to do the hard work and show that these are genes, uh, you know, mediating respiration. There was some esoteric microbiologist working on some environmental uh, growth issue, which is always not very much appreciated by NIH, but I think it's a very important part of science to have that basic knowledge that we can all build on, and I think it was a good example for, for that. So as I said in the beginning, we, I was fascinated because in virology, there's always an argument, do viruses evolve to become more virulent? When people talk about influenza virus, there is always this I idea that it becomes more virulent, but it doesn't, it makes sense unless it helps transmission. But in your example, with the salmonella and the iron battle, there's a very clear reason to become more virulent, and that is so that you can inhibit the growth of other bacteria in the gut. We don't have such mechanisms for viruses yet. I assume at some point we will. But I, that's why I like it, and we'll, I will take this story back to our virology podcast, because we have lots of listeners who always ask, what's more important? evolving to be transmissible or virulent? Yes, Jim. Um, we've got a question from the internet um, in the Ustream chat. Um, Andrew, grad student, has a question, and it looks to me that it has something to do with uh, the discussion you were having earlier regarding the HIV salmonella co-infection. Uh, the question reads, HIV destroys or weakens the epithelial cells of the gut during early infection. Does this help with or cause the infection? I assume he's referring to the salmonella. So the early, the early interaction of HIV with the intestine is not associated with uh, bacteremia. It is, so in the beginning of HIV, you have the virus replicating in the gut. Within six weeks or so, the T cells in the gut are, are depleted severely. But then you have a very long, what, what is, has been called pre previously latency period, but we know now that the virus replicates in other niches where you don't see much of a drop in T cells in the periphery. And then when they start dropping and you start developing HIV uh, disease, uh, AIDS, then, uh, then is the case when you see salmonella bacteremia. So it is the systemic defects that really are associated with salmonella bacteremia, not so much the early local events. So that's the clinical correlation, and I think it's usually very helpful to look at that. Thank you. That came from the chat room, that yes. question? All right, thank you. All right, let's move on to Paul. And you, we could have picked any of a dozen different things to talk about. You're a, you, you work on many different areas. What's, is there a common thread amongst all of them? I guess most of what we do is driven by a desire to understand evolutionary process. Um, so we, we, we adopt a variety of different approaches, uh, outright experimental manipulation of populations mm -hmm. uh, to test particular attributes of, uh, of evolutionary theory. Uh, others are more open-ended, just let things go and see what happens. Um, uh, the evolution of multicellularity, uh, transitions and in individuality is another mm -hmm. one. Right. We get easily distracted, <laughs> but, but evolutionary <laughs> process is what? Easily distracted. But it's all about yeah. food, you I said. Right? I think that's right, yeah, making a living. <laughs> well, food, food in order to replicate. Right. You, you don't get to replicate unless you have food. So uh, one aspect of your work that I picked that I found interesting, we haven't talked about this on TWIM, uh, was the, is the presence of repetitive sequences yeah. in bacterial genomes. Mm -hmm. And mm. I was surprised to hear that there are many different sorts. There's a huge number of different repetitive mm -hmm. sequences in bacterial genomes. Uh, you know, microbiologists have known for a long time uh, about rep sequences in particular, repetitive extragenic palindromic sequences. These are short sequences. They are found primarily between genes. Uh, and they're actually imperfect palindromes. They're not mm -hmm. perfect palindromes. but um, they were discovered, I guess, in the early 80s, uh, certainly before, well, before sequencing was routine, uh, and were primarily used uh, as fingerprinting uh, markers, mm -hmm. uh, and indeed they've been widely uh, used in that regard. So they were found in E. coli, and then as uh, people explored a little further, uh, repetitive sequences became apparent uh, in, in, well, in, in every genome, in mm -hmm. fact, has repetitive sequences. They've been variously categorized uh, and classified. Um, in, in fact, the classification of these things is, is really a, a mess. The names don't particularly mean anything. But, but also worth saying that, you know, just uh, you know, even your question, you know, tells about repetitive sequences, uh, supposes that these entities 
um, you know, are real things uh, that perhaps mm -hmm. uh, have an evolutionary origin, sure. but uh, it's entirely possible that uh, repetitive sequences, particularly the short ones, may th be there by chance alone. Right, that's one thing you're interested in. Right. And how do you distinguish between them being there by chance or yeah. they have evolved to be there? That's right. Well, in principle, it's simple. <laughs> you construct a null model. You basically mm -hmm. randomize uh, the genome. But actually, constructing good null models where, from which you could um, uh, obtain measures of the abundance and distribution of sequences as they would right. appear by random is actually tough. Uh, it's not easily done. However, it can be done. Uh, the most powerful null models come from a, a very, if you happen to have a very closely related uh, genome to perhaps a, a focal genome that might have a very high number of repetitive sequences. Mm -hmm. But by certainly testing that hypothesis that repetitive sequences uh, are more abundant than you would expect by chance is something that's tremendously important and, and mm -hmm. actually not often done. We tend to find repetitive sequences and go, oh, goodness me, um, you know, they've been put there for the curiosity of molecular biologists. It's, it's simply to molecular biologists to work out their function. And mm -hmm. indeed, they may simply be uh, there by chance and have no function. But, you know, that's an interesting concept because mm -hmm. biologists as a whole hate the idea mm. that something is just due to chance, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, we, I think in, as a first principle, we don't accept that, yeah. e even though yeah. in fact yeah. it, it could be true. Yeah, 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 yeah. But as you know, we have them in our cells as well. Yeah, exactly, yes, and, yes. Uh, and in fact, an interesting statistic is 40% of our genome is viral. That's right, and transposon related. Yeah, and transposon yeah. related, yeah, yeah, yeah. and we don't understand and he, it always comes back mm. to this. We don't mm. feel that it should be there without having a purpose. Mm. It's so much energy, mm. to, energy mm. to replicate it. That's right. What yeah. fraction of the bacterial genome is this repetitive? Well, it, it very much depends. Uh, the focal bug for our work is the Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas fluorescens. Uh, mm. It has uh, more than 12 different kinds of repetitive element. These short rep-like elements, uh, there is something like uh, 1,400 rep sequences in a genome mm -hmm. of about 6.7 megabases. So uh, it's a very substantial part of yeah. the genome, organized in all sorts of complex manners and ranging in size from uh, little, you know, 16 mers right up to um, uh, very complex structures of, of hundreds of bases. Yeah. So can you look at the sequences and estimate how long they've been in the genome? Uh, well, uh, Yes, you can. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if a set of sequences of any kind are identical, and you've got many of them, mm -hmm. they've almost certainly uh, arisen by a very rapid and recent right. expansion. Uh, if there's a lot of variation among them, uh, then they've probably been there a long time. Um, you can, I mean, molecular uh, evolutionary uh, phylogenetists, I guess, um, using um, estimates of mutation rate, the molecular mm -hmm. clock, indeed, you can sure. obtain some sort of estimate. So have we been able to get such numbers for, uh, for these? No, things? actually, they're very difficult. Okay. That's a very difficult problem. The sequences are really too short for the variation that you see there to be informative. It's built up so much over time that it becomes uh, no signal. Now, you, you, you discuss in, in your paper that these are able to replicate and move around in the genome? That's, that's right. So um, how does that work? Well, I, I guess the first thing I should say, in this particular study, we, and we here as a very talented computational biologist, Frederick Bertels, uh, uh, we decided it was time to take a fresh look at these repetitive sequences. Mm -hmm. um, so we sat back and just said, uh, let's ask about the distribution of short words in these genomes. Um, let's start at 10 nucleotides in length and go up to 20. After that, uh, it's not quite so interesting for us. Uh, generate random models, null models against which we can test the numbers in abundance in, in this focal genome against. And what we found were that uh, uh, there are words, short words, primarily of length 16 in this one genome that are hugely overrepresented, way more than you can account for by mm -hmm. chance. Mm -hmm. um, so that suggests something's going on. Well, in fact, you can conclude, having rejected the null hypothesis of chance, that natural selection is playing a role. Mm -hmm. Now, at that stage, you've got two possibilities. One is that they may be there for some functional reason associated with the cell. Let's say they may all be uh, involved in transcription termination because they form nice hairpin structures mm -hmm. and they're found between genes. 
Uh, indeed, uh, um, there's been quite, a, quite a, a body of work that shows that these repetitive sequences in different contexts and different organisms do have functional consequences for the cell. However, the curious thing is if you take two organisms that are closely related, E. coli, pseudomonas, doesn't matter what it is, and look at the distribution of these short repetitive sequences, then between the two genomes they'll be hugely different. Mm. One may ha virtually have none, another may have a, 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 you know, a truckload. Um, that suggests that they aren't there uh, as regulatory elements, for example. If mm -hmm. they were, you would expect very similar patterns between the two strains. So if you've got a, a, an element that is more abundant than you would expect by chance, uh, is variably distributed between two strains, it strongly suggests that it's not there to aid, at least in the first instance, the host. It's there in its own right as some kind of selfish element. Yeah. You've got to account for the fact that there are hundreds or thousands of these uh, around the mm -hmm. genome. And so what Frederick did then, having identified uh, these overly abundant sequences, which, which I should say were words of 16 in length, but they were not rep sequences. However, they overlapped with rep sequences, which was very curious. And using a sophisticated grouping algorithm, Frederick showed that out of these literally thousands of 16 MERS, they fell into three groups, just three groups that overlapped with the rep. So the, the, the hypothesis at this stage is that these things are, are replicative elements and they're probably selfish. They're making a living simply out of overrepresenting themselves around the genome. So what is the rec replicative unit? You know, what really is replicating it? Is, it? is it the 16 MER or is that 16 MER a part of something larger? Mm -hmm. Uh, the long and the short of it is actually that 16 mer is part of something larger. It's part of a, a, an entity that we call a repin, which is two rep sequences that are organized as direct repeats um, uh, with particular spacing between these mm -hmm. elements. And uh, we happen to get lucky with our, our, our genome being the f initial focus and that there were, as I said before, three different flavors of rep sequences. There were three different flavors of repins, and this really stuck out. Most organisms just have one flavor of repin. And these things seem to be getting around. So they can, they're mobile genetic elements, basically. They're transposon-like elements? That, that, that's right. They're transposon-like elements, um, mm -hmm. but they're too small to uh, encode right. their own uh, right. tra transposition ability. And they are like uh, 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 minute, well, there is a term that has been applied to a particular class of repetitive sequence found first in plants, actually, and shown to be active in plants, mm -hmm. and then inferred to be in bacteria, but the evidence that they're active in bacteria is not being forthcoming. Uh, called mites, miniature inverted transposable elements. And what these look like are the ends of transposons. Uh, and in the plant world, what was shown is that these ends of the transposons have acquired a life of their own. So they've left the transposon, come together, said goodbye to the transposon, uh, and effectively parasitized the transposon. So the transposon encodes the transposase. Mm -hmm. These little sequences then say, thank you very much. I won't bother with making the, the, the enzyme, uh, but I'll take advantage of that that you're making, and I'll copy myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's amazing. So parasites are parasites are <laughs> parasites. Are, yeah. so, so let me, this is what fascinates me trying to wrap my head around this new topic area, is I like the fact that you use the word words. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the sequences, I, I thought first, What's magical about 16 MERS? Yeah, yeah. And the second thing I thought mm -hmm. is trying to relate it back to language. Mm. Are these 16 MERS nouns, verbs, prepositions, commas, or periods? <laughs> to, to take it to the language metaphor, and, and mm -hmm. you were alluding to that with your transposon example. So will that metaphor help me think of how to design experiments to ask whether or not these reps really have a function in order to try to think, if I was a young graduate student mm, trying to figure mm. out how to get into this mm, field and, mm, and mm. think about designing experiments, mm. would grammar help me or would multi-syllable words or these one-syllable yeah. words or two-syllable words? Uh, or? I'm not sure. I, I always hesitate. I, I think we get into trouble when yeah. we anthropomorphize. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we find things very attractive when um, actually it's not like that at all. Uh, but, but actually it's an interesting um, perspective to think about. I mean, uh, I'll think about it as I speak and <laughs> maybe we can. Just, <laughs> yeah. but, um, I think the first thing in terms of function and studying these things, and indeed there's, a, there's, a, there's an entire um, uh, uh, world of, of selfish elements out there, particularly in microbes that um, 
we don't know about, primarily because I think we've, we've assumed that when we see a sequence that has some special flavor, oh, yeah. that it's there for the good of the cell and it need not be. Um, in this particular case, it's, it's very clear they're not there initially. Their, their, their evolutionary origins are not uh, connected with them doing good for the cell. They're doing good for themselves. However, uh, it's entirely possible that they could do some good for the cell and be co-opted for something else. And indeed, I think that is the case. In fact, the, the numerous studies over the years that have shown that uh, rep sequences in E. coli and a particular operon, for example, uh, well, they've shown in different contexts, uh, binding sites for integration, host factor, um, modulates promoter activity, roles in transcription termination. I think these are all real discoveries and they, uh, they are really true for that particular rep and that organism in that context. And that would reflect probably the fact that they've been co-opted uh, for some purpose in the cell after they've gone in. Yeah. But, but Paul, if you, mm. if you think about them promoting their own replication mm. And, mm. and increase, presumably they have to be big enough to be a binding site for something or, yeah, or to a, promote yes. their self-cleavage yeah. or somehow. And so maybe mm. that helps define yeah. the minimum size word that you need oh, to be I effective. See. Uh, okay, well, yeah, the minimum size, uh, the in, in terms of us uh, suggesting 16 mer, we chose 16 mer be, for a reason. It was, it was at 16, not 17 or 15, that there was the greatest difference between um, the, the, the numbers of these sequences uh, compared to a, uh, a test, a, a null strain. Um, our subsequent work, though, showed that uh, actually the element is bigger than that. Um, but that's, a, you know, Stan, you, you raise a really interesting point um, that they've indeed got to be big enough to be able to interact with, uh, in this case, if we're right, the transposes. Um, and that kind of uh, raises a, a further issue, which is perhaps connected with the function, which is when these things go into the, when these repins go into the genome, of course, they take with them the binding site oh, yeah. for uh, a protein. It happens to be a transposase, uh, but it's also a protein. So, um, kind of getting ahead of where we might get in a little while, but uh, there are some interesting sort of a, there's some interesting issues that are raised when we start talking about the transposase responsible. Uh, there's some kind of addiction thing going on within the cell, and it may be connected for, by, to the fact that these entities, when they enter the genome, do take in uh, uh, are now able to recruit a protein, uh, and in some contexts that might actually be useful. Uh, you know. Very often when these things jump, they will be into the middle of genes and mm -hmm. they're eliminated by selection. Mm -hmm. you, you almost never find these in genes. If you do, it'll just be at the ends of genes. You find them between, that's probably where they're tolerated. When they go in, they're either going to be neutral, but I think under some circumstances, probably as by virtue of being a certain size sufficient to take on the, uh, a bind, a, a transposase, simply perhaps the binding of a protein in and of itself uh, has some potentially useful features um, mm. for the cell. But Stan, even this sequence between genes has a function. It, there's a spacer of some kind, and it can tolerate these insertions, and that's how they, they take a free ride, basically. Well, I think that's being a little unfair about the definition of a function. I think that if you, if you define a function uh, too liberally, Mm. then you eliminate any possibility for saying something mm. was just chance, mm. right? Yeah. Mm. And, and I think it's, that's important. So, mm, sure. and this, this comes up with a, a lot of, mm. of microbiologists who, who are not card-carrying evolutionary biologists who try to make arguments about yeah. evolution. Mm. And I'm one of them, so, you know, I, I know, we, you know mm. a lot of times yeah, yeah. We, we make statements like that, that, that mm. evolutionary biologists roll over in their grave. Mm. Or they wish they were dead so they could roll over. <laughs> no, it's always yeah. interesting. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, if you could remove all of them from yeah. the genome, yeah. if you could, I know you can't, but yeah. if you could, what do you think the outcome would be? Y yeah, that's very oh, interesting. Well, you. there are clearly um, s some organisms, even closely related strains. I, I should say these things are very widespread. Even E. coli has one, and it also has a, um, a, a very mm -hmm. unusual transposase related to IS-200 that seems to be the business for getting these things around. Mm -hmm. So they're widespread, they're not just in this one organism. They have the same configuration to rep sequences. Are they in Archaea as well? No, they're not in Archaea, yeah. this particular flavor, no. 
But, yeah. but so the real interesting yeah. question now is yeah. if you take E. coli, yeah. and there are these very reduced yeah. genomes yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. that came from E. coli, yeah. do the reduced genomes still have them? Uh, th that I don't know. Um, uh, I mean, if you, if you could take them out, I mean, it, I, yeah, I guess if we can look to natural experiments. There are organisms that really don't have any of these, even closely related strains. So it seems that you could take them out. The really curious thing, though, um, well, here, here's a really curious thing. Uh, we, we talked about these uh, mites that seem to make a living, the ends of transposons that exploit a transposase mm -hmm. uh, and jump about then. Non autonomous um, elements. But in all of the cases that have been known, the transposase itself is also capable of moving itself around. Oh, yeah. okay. Now, theory does suggest uh, or predicts that indeed transposons, if you've got a transposon, you should see the evolution of non-autonomous elements. You would see evolution of cheats effect, par parasites. You, you would expect these. But you expect the transposon and the transposase to have a life of its own, to be able to keep moving. In the case of these repins, the entity that appears to be responsible for their movement is present just in a single copy per genome. So that single copy transposable element seems to no longer have a life of its own. So the real curious thing is what maintains it within the cell. Uh, any mutation that arises in that transposase, if it's not able to move, would simply eliminate it. But these things are not limited. They're actually under strong selection. They're clearly doing something for the cell. So I think the really curious thing is, what happens if you take out the, these, this IS-200? And the answer is, uh, actually, nothing major. <laughs> but How, it's still selected for. Well, so, uh, so we had some ideas initially which, which envisaged uh, some kind of addiction system. That, that, uh, oh, that, the famous toxin antidote system. That kind of thing, that if you took out this, some, something is maintaining it in the genome. Yes. So we took these out, and the cells are viable. Yeah. They have some so. curious phenotypes depending upon carbon source. I mean, in some carbon sources, they actually grow better without these, trans, this transposase. Uh, in other, with other carbon sources, they grow less well. So there's, that's curious in, this, in itself. I mean, our current work is, is designed to try and understand why this thing is having the function. And, and, and one idea is related to what we were talking about before, that, that when these repins have gone into particular places in the genome, act as recruiting sites for, for, for this protein, that that may actually have been, in, in various uh, contexts, useful for the cell, uh, altering its, um, perhaps fine-tuning its regulatory response to different environmental changes. Have you gone on a hunt to look for them in the poor mitochondria or the huh. chloroplast? Yeah. which are presumably yeah. bacteria that were captured by the eukaryotes and enslaved. Yeah. Yeah. And do, yeah. they, do they have reps? Uh, yeah, no, not that I'm aware of, nor these transposases that seem to uh, distantly related. So to after you get captured yeah. the perfect cell, mm -hmm. you need not need them any longer because mm -hmm. your diet has been predestined. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, you don't need them, I don't think. I think the cells, well, this is, you know, so in and of themselves, they're selfish. They're making a living, jumping yes. around. They're causing havoc. But as we know from insertion sequences and transposons in, in our genome as well as microbial genomes, you know, the, every now and then, well, you know, most mutations, be they caused by a single nucleotide substitution or the insertion of, a, of an insertion sequence, most of the time they'll be deleterious, but a small amount of the time, they would be beneficial. Mm -hmm. So they could be important, you know, um, well, they will certainly have an impact on the evolution of microbes, no doubt about it. So, so Paul, one of the things mm. you said was that th there's strong selective pressure for the transposase. Yeah. Right? Mm. Uh, most of us, when we think of strong selective pressure, we say, well, it, it, it must have a key role that we could see every mm. generation. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah. how, how much does the pressure have to be? What if it was only important once every hundred generations? Would that be strong enough selective pressure to, to do yeah. this? Well, I guess it would depend how important once every hundred generations of it was and the rate of loss. Uh, so it, you know, it could be. You don't need to have selection. Uh, and it depends on things like the population size in particular. Um, you could have a periodic Sort of selection. like levees here in New Orleans. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> yeah. You don't need yeah. them unless the river rises. <laughs> That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there any evidence that they jump? Direct from, evidence? Yeah. 
the best, yeah, yeah I would say <laughs> cautiously, we've got pretty good evidence. So we, we um, you know, having done all this computational stuff uh, and constructed some nice stories, you do want to get some <laughs> uh, hard evidence. Mm. Um, we, we did various things uh, and didn't pick up anything. However, we did resequence uh, very deeply, uh, deep coverage, uh, a single where we sequenced a population of cells grown overnight from a single colony. Uh, we sequenced that 200-fold um, coverage, mm -hmm. so very deep. You know, we had something like 60 million reads. And we looked at those reads to see if we could find evidence of uh, movement, uh, jumps in particular. Now, we did. We found about uh, 18 mm -hmm. jumps. The trouble is we were never able to discount the possibility that these were uh, machine error or chemistry error. Mm. Uh, but we realized, uh, yeah, there are ways we could try and test it, but if, if they were true, they were happening, so you basically split your cells in half, do a piece, you know. But the, the jumps, if there were 18, you know, this would be an incredibly low yeah. rate of jumping, and everything, other, other data points to low rates of jumping as well. So what, uh, what we did do, uh, which turned out to be, uh, I think, much more productive, was to look for evidence of excision events and here we're using paired end selexa reads. So if you get an excision event, there is no way that that can be other than a genuine you, you know, machine error cannot give, give the rise to that. So we found uh, four instances, four out of 60 million reads of excision events um, that uh, were, cu were particularly curious with regard to, to, to what we found. Uh, so. Uh, these repins, again, they have a, uh, the rep sequences and, and an intergenic region. They're all predict, although the intergenic, the spacer region, can be quite variable, but in each case it forms a large hairpin structure. Uh, so it's, it's nice and, and symmetrical. In each instance, the reed that we found has a five prime overhanging tail, uh, which is particularly curious with regard to the mechanism of IS200 transposition. And the transposition intermediate has. Uh, an overhanging five prime tail, and uh, one needs a chalkboard to show this, but that overhanging five prime tail is almost certainly important in terms of integration and reformation of the, um, um, the, the, the complementary sequence at the other end. So, so this is our best evidence thus far, but right. you know, it, it's, 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 it's telling the fact that these things, we didn't actually expect them to have these overlapping, these overhanging tails, in each case they did. Uh, and I should say, in one instance of the excision event actually uh, happened really early, so all of the reads, hundreds of reads across one region, right. indicated right. it had completely gone from the entire population. Right. So. Anything else, gentlemen? Well, I, I'd just like to say, that this concept, four out of 60 million reads. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you, you, yeah. you really have yeah. to get your hands yeah. on that. Yeah. It, it, I think amazing. it emphasizes why there is so much excitement yeah. in microbiology yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You can do things yeah. Yeah. to study evolution that you could yeah. never do before. Yeah. 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 Some of the studies to understand what's going on with salmonella involve new techniques that we didn't have mm. a short while ago. And for sure, the studies that we heard about earlier mm. on mm. The, the marine microbes mm. and the mm. symbionts. Mm. I mean, they, mm. th these are things that if you were at an ASM meeting 10 years yeah, ago, yeah. people would not be having this conversation. No, 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 it is quite extraordinary. I think these sorts of you know, there's, there's so much, I think, that we're yet to realize that we could turn next generation sequencing to, you know, I mean, it already has gone beyond just sequencing, but, uh, yeah, to be able to capture intermediates uh, in the transposition yeah. process, for example, makes you wonder, uh, you know, what, just what you could use it for. Yeah. Uh, gives yeah. a whole new meaning to sequencing beyond just getting A's, C's, G's, mm, and T's. Mm, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which is how we were brought up with sequencing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I know Elio yeah. doesn't want us to say that. He says, I don't want to hear you say when I was. <laughs> as no. long as we don't talk about <laughs> pouring the sequencing gels. Well, actually, that's how I first got interested in these rep sequences, was running um, uh, acrylamide gels. Which you had to look at. You had to look at, and as many of you would have seen, <laughs> you get uh, um, constructs that you just can't sequence through. Yeah. Sure. And it's typically because you've got a hairpin structure. Yeah, Stanley has probably done that. I certainly yeah, have done yeah. that. And so Andreas I wondered. Andreas as yeah, well. Yeah. What the hell? And then when the genome sequence comes along, well, actually, for a long time, it wasn't possible to close this genome because there were too many hairpin structures. 
uh, some new chemistry came through, they sequenced mm -hmm. through, and then we realized this thing that I couldn't sequence through in 1995 turns out to have, you know, this particular one was represented something like um, 800 times in wow. the genome. So <laughs> Mother Nature never... Yeah never does anything for not a reason. Yeah, and that's right. That's uh, see, this is the argument <laughs> against chance, right? <laughs> that's exactly the argument. <laughs> At least that's how, you know, I hate to say this, you know, it's, it's, it's how you begin to think about the selective pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, I was trained as a selective pressure microbiologist. Mm -hmm. You can enrich mm -hmm. for anything. Mm -hmm. You know, the doctrine mm. of microbial infallibility. Mm -hmm. There's not a natural substance occurring on this planet mm -hmm. that a microbe cannot mm -hmm. degrade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you just make mm -hmm. your enrichment correctly, you can pull mm -hmm. out the right microbe if you know how to ask it to eat it nicely. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. trick is mm -hmm. asking it nicely. Mm. Because there are a lot of unculturable microbes. Yeah. And yeah. you really, ultimately, everything is culturable if you ask nicely. And that's yeah. doing the yeah. right experiment. And it's kind of interesting to think about that experiment, though. Yeah, I mean, Im implicit in, in what you've just described is the notion that that organism exists there in the environment, uh, and you will just uh, pull it out. You know, the, the other th th thought there is, in fact, it doesn't exist there in the environment. Its ancestral types do, and that when you do an enrichment, actually what you're doing is a you're, you're, you're selection. You're, <laughs> you're, 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 evol sure. you're imposing very strong selection, and evolution is, is occurring in response to that selection. So what you get out, you know, you've, you've effectively selected directly for evolution has actually taken place uh, from the moment you applied that selective pressure. The microbial yeah. world is pluripotent. Well, on that note, I hate to cut short this discussion, but we should think about wrapping up. And I'm glad we had a terrific discussion. Um, before we do finish, I would like to read two emails, just because they are a tradition on these podcasts. And just to show you, uh, very briefly, the breadth of the audience we have. Uh, so the first one uh, is from Catherine who says, I uh, work as a research technician at a medical veterinary entomology lab and spend several hours of my day counting and identifying mosquitoes caught in traps in rice paddies hmm. when I'm not sitting in a makeshift African hut. Your podcasts have saved my sanity on multiple occasions. While I work closely with vectors of many of the parasites' pathogens you discuss, it is great to learn about the mechanisms of infection and disease, a subject which I feel I am slightly lacking in. I just finished reading a couple of books about the history and discovery of prions and why I, I am not sure they can be classified as microbes. I would love to hear a show on the subject. I've become slightly obsessed. Keep up the great podcasting. I have several thousand more mosquitoes to go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. And the other one we'll read is from Robin, who is an MD in Nevada. And Robin writes, look forward to all the TWI discussions. Last month's TWIM on Salmonella, with its reference to typhoid fever, reminded me of Bertolucci's 20-year-old film masterpiece, The Sheltering Sky, in which Port, played by John Malkovich, contracts typhoid. I read the book. Have you read this book? No. Sheltering Sky, John, uh, by, um, who's the author? Paul Bowles. A story written by Paul Bowles, she writes, is interesting by itself in that Bowles lives in Tangier, where the story plays out, and for his friendship with William Burroughs. Mm -hmm. Deborah Winger is magnificent as Kit Malkovich's wife at the end of the film. The viewer struggles with moral issues and whether or not Kit lost her sanity. Reading the book doesn't help. The <laughs> photography and the acting are superb. The progression of the typhoid fever in Port is accurately portrayed. The source of Port's infection is only hinted at. As one of the world's greatest films, the film was grossly underrated by film reviewers. Nevertheless, most people with a scientific background will appreciate the film and likely give it the highest ratings. So there you go. Just two examples of the terrific emails we get on TWIM. So that will do it for another TWIM, our first live episode. You can find TWIM episodes at iTunes at the Zoom Marketplace or at microbeworld.org slash twim. We also have an app which you can use to stream the episodes to your iPhone or Android device. Go over to microbeworld.org slash app to find out more about that. If you do like twim, please tell your friends about it. Links and reviews in iTunes really help us stay on the front page. And if you want to ask us a question or send a comment, send it to twim at twiv.tv or go over to microbeworld.org slash twim and leave a comment there. 
I'd like to thank everybody for participating today. Nicole Dubillier, of course, who left is at the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology. Andreas Baumler is at the University of California, Davis. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Andreas. Andreas. I fun. hope you enjoyed it. Paul Rainey is at the Massey University in New Zealand. Thank you. It was thank great you for being coming. Here. Coming no. all the way from New Zealand right. to do a twi Indeed. twin. Thank you very much. <laughs> and of course, our regulars, Stan Malloy, San Diego State University. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks very thank much, you. Vince. And Michael Schmidt at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Vincent. It's a pleasure sitting next to you as opposed to through Skype. Yeah, now and then we get to do that, not very often. But the good thing is it does work through Skype. Yeah. Yes, which right. Which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Vincent Racaniello, of course. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd really like to thank ASM for letting us do this. Barbara Hyde, the communications director, and also Chris Kendayan, Ray Ortega, and Andrea, who are behind the scenes here making it work. Thanks, guys. And you too. I don't know your name for Paul. running the mics. Paul. Paul. Thanks, Paul. Paul, for running the mics. And I'm, our audience, which has left, but there were a lot, <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of them at one point. And now we were going to tell them to look under the chairs for their prize. Yeah, but we're going to take the prizes ourselves. Do we know how many guys were on, uh, online at the chat? Uh, 36 concurrent. At, or up to 42, and then the total for the day is 1,578, but that's over the course of running right. Ustream Live. Mm -hmm. 600. 600 we had, so thanks all of you 600 who were listening to us. We appreciate it, and for the individual who sent in that one question. <coughs> thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. <laughs>